Okay, great. So I'm excited to tell you about our effort to develop protease inhibitors for SARS-CoV-2. So thanks for letting me present the work of the team here. So this is the team we put together who's working on this project. We're working with David Ho and Shoei Katani in his laboratory and uh, Alex Chavez up at the medical center. And in my lab, Michael Stokes, Hungry Lou and Hui Tan and uh, Ari Zask who works with me in the chemical probe synthesis lab. And then we're working with a number of other people, Brandon Fowler, Farhad, John, uh, Chuck, Karen. And we've got some technical assistance now from Waters Corp who's donating their expertise to this effort. And the funding has come a pilot grant from Columbia Technology Ventures and the Jack Ma Foundation. So protease inhibitors, uh, viral protease inhibitors have been breakthrough medicines for other viral infections. In particular, if we look back at HIV with the introduction of highly effective uh, antiretroviral therapy uh, in 1996, with the inclusion of protease inhibitors, you can see a, a large decrease in the number of deaths due to HIV infection with that, when that therapy became available. Similarly, with hepatitis C virus, uh, now 90 to 95% patient response um, in many cases with uh, incorporation of, of HCV protease inhibitors. So these can be very effective therapies for viral infections. Now, in terms of uh, coronaviruses, as we know, there are a number of coronaviruses, at least seven of which cause disease in humans, three, three of which cause severe disease, including SARS-CoV-2. Now, SARS-CoV-2 has a single-stranded RNA genome, about 30 kilobases, and the virus generates, the viral genome generates two large polyproteins, and these end up being key for the life cycle of the virus. So the large polyproteins that are produced have to be cleaved by a viral protease, actually there are two viral proteases, um, and into the individual proteins that are necessary for the, the function and the life cycle of the virus. So that's the activity of this viral protease that we're talking about. Um, and actually, Nikki Berolini uh, put together this little animation for people who aren't familiar with this. So when the virus uh, infects cells, it releases its RNA, the RNA gets translated on the ribosome, and then you get these large polyproteins being produced and then they have to be cleaved by uh, this protease in order for the virus to complete its life cycle and, and replicate. So the question we had at the beginning was, is it possible to inhibit the SARS-CoV-2, um, and in particular what's called the 3CL or the main protease? There, as I said, there are two, but one of them, the, the 3CL protease, cleaves the polyprotein in at least 11 different sites. Um, and is, is the major protease involved in viral replication. So can we inhibit that protease with a drug-like small molecule eventually as a treatment analogous to what's been done for HIV and, and HCV? So uh, importantly, the coronaviruses, uh, this is looking at 12 different coronaviruses, uh, and the structures of the proteases, the 3CL proteases across all of these coronaviruses are very similar. If you look here at the overlay of the structures, these are structures that were determined, and the red indicates identical. So they're, most of these are, are virtually identical, if not identical, and then there are some small regions of difference suggesting that a viral protease inhibitor would probably have pan-selectivity across a number of uh, coronaviruses, including future coronaviruses that might be generated. So the search for these uh, inhibitors of the protease goes back to a compound that was developed by Pfizer and Agaron around uh, the 1999-2000 era. Uh, this was a peptidic inhibitor called rupintravir. Um, it actually was developed as a rhinovirus 3C protease. So there's an analogous protease in rhinoviruses. Um, and this is a lone animal or potency inhibitor. It was developed as a nasal spray. It's a, it's a peptide-like structure. So uh, they administered it as a nasal spray. It was effective actually in a phase two study, and then it was ultimately discontinued by Pfizer due to poor efficacy in natural settings. But if we look at some of their clinical data, 
you can see that the viral titer um, was significantly reduced by this uh, protease inhibitor. Now this protease inhibitor, rupintravir, unfortunately is not active against the coronavirus proteases. So it, it was tested against SARS, so 2003 SARS uh, coronavirus and was not active. However, a group in Taiwan modified rupintravir and came up with uh, compound 18, which is active against the SARS-1, the original SARS protease with a nanomolar potency, about 58 nanomolar, um, and, act and was active in a cell model of another coronavirus, the 229E coronavirus replication, um, at a little bit less than one micromolar, so reasonable potency. So that, now I should say all of these uh, inhibitors are actually covalent inhibitors. So the, the protease, the 3CL protease is a cysteine protease. It has an active site nucleophilic cysteine residue. It's assisted by a histidine in uh, the active site. And that cysteine then reacts with some kind of what we would call a warhead on the inhibitor and either a Michael type acceptor with a double bond, electrophilic double bond or, or other types of warheads. And actually now a variety of warheads have been explored for these uh, coronavirus uh, protease inhibitors. The original ones were Pintravir and Compen18 have this Michael acceptor. Um, and now there's some alpha keto amides and, and other groups uh, have been explored. And particularly, interestingly, this bisulfite salt, which is kind of a protected version of an aldehyde as a warhead. Aldehydes generally aren't that stable, but this uh, bisulfite warhead is, is much more stable and soluble. And in particular, there's a compound that's uh, called GC376, which incorporates this bisulfite warhead. So that gets unmasked, presumably generates the aldehyde, and then that acts as an inhibitor of the viral protease. And this compound uh, was shown to have an IC50 of four micromolar. So moderate potency against the SARS uh, COV, the original SARS 2003 3CL protease, um, but it was pretty effective against some feline, uh, coronavi feline coronavirus that causes this uh, feline cat disease, feline infectious peritonitis. Um, and, and the eyes of the cats get kind of um, cloudy and, and you can see that resolves upon treatment. And if you look at the viral reduction, viral load reduction, and this was effectively a clinical trial in cats. Um, it was a significant reduction in, in viral burden um, in, in a variety of cats that were treated with this. So that's the second uh, potential inhibitor. And then the third one we've been looking at is Epsilon, which is a, a traditional small molecule. Um, it's well tolerated in patients, been tested in clinical studies. Um, and it has a decent pharmacokinetics. Uh, it was tested for hearing loss in patients, but it does react covalently with some cysteine-containing protein. So it's looked like another possible candidate. So Sho in uh, David Ho's lab was able to express and purify the protease tagged or untagged, as shown here, and then confirm it has the expected protease activity. It's well-behaved. And then this can serve as a basis for an in vitro biochemical assay to look for inhibitors. And uh, Hungry Lu in my lab, working with uh, Brandon Fowler in the chemistry department in the mass spectrometry facility, um, was able to show that if we mix the protease with the compound 18, so that's the first of these three inhibitors that I mentioned, um, we can see by mass spectrometry a one-to-one -one complex quantitatively forming. So we're basically converting the protease into this covalent complex with the inhibitor. So it is binding and reacting as we would hope. And then uh, Hungry and Sho were working together. We're able to show that um, actually compound 18, if we, we add it to a biochemical assay with the protease and a substrate, we can see relatively potent inhibition of the protease with an IC50 about in the 100 nanomolar range. Um, and also these other two compounds work as well. So GC376 with that bisulfite warhead um, also has about 100 nanomolar potency and uh, Epsilon is about 200 nanomolar. So all three of these compounds can inhibit the protease effectively. This I should say, of course, is for the SARS-CoV-2 protease, the, the one that we're interested in here. 
Now then the next question is, are these compounds drug-like? Do they have good stability and solubility or things that, that could be actually administered? Um, and obviously there's some precedent, so we were optimistic about that. If we look at, at stability in human plasma, compound 18 and GC376 we have here are very stable. So that's uh, promising. They're not degraded, even though uh, they're relatively peptide-like. And uh, in mouse plasma, GC376 is very stable, but uh, compound 18 is less so. So that would need some improvement to go into mouse uh, studies with compound 18. But GC376 looks promising. And also we looked at some other assays. I won't go through all the data, but microsomal stability, which models liver metabolism, and again, GC376, very stable. Uh, compound 18 would need some improvement. So uh, finally, recently, uh, Manaj Nair and Yaoxing Huang and David Ho's lab were able to test these three compounds for their ability to inhibit the replication of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in a cell-based assay. Um, and actually, all of these three inhibitors, these three protease inhibitors, all had some activity. So uh, epsilon, you can see here, kicks in above 10 micromolar. And uh, compound 18 has, has weaker activity. We think that's a combination of low water solubility and, and probably low cell permeability. And if we could improve those properties, then you might be able to see the potency because it is intrinsically uh, a potent inhibitor, but it just doesn't have the other properties that we need yet. And GC376 was the most promising of these three. Um, really giving us a complete inhibition eventually and the most potent of the three, uh, suggesting that this is a good scaffold to improve upon. We want to improve the potency somewhat, although it already has very good uh, stability, metabolic and plasma stability and solubility. So we think that's a promising candidate. So to summarize, uh, we think the SARS-CoV-2, 3CL protease, is amenable to covalent inhibition with small molecules, uh, analogous again to what's been done with HIV and HCV. And we think it should be possible to modify uh, a particular GC376, but also potentially compound 18 and epsilon into a clinical candidate that would have good drug-like properties, including this metabolic plasma stability, solubility, cell permeability, um, really the, the drug-like properties that we need for therapy um, as a treatment eventually for patients with COVID-19. So um, I'll stop there and uh, we can take some questions. That's great, Brent. Uh, uh, so one of the disadvantages of therapy directed at viral proteins is that these viruses are under tremendous evolutionary pressures and have mutational rates. Um, and so there's a, a sort of a possible selection and adaptation of the virus uh, to uh, drugs that target these, uh, these proteins. Um, I was wondering whether this has been the case for, uh, you know, HIV I think has a lower mutational rate compared to uh, either influenza and uh, I think uh, coronavirus is somewhere in the middle, but half the mutational rate of, uh, of influenza. Um, but do you know whether there, this may be a concern? Yeah, that's always a great question. That's always the issue. And I think so with HIV, the strategy was this uh, triple therapy so that if you come in with a combination with different inhibitors, then it doesn't give the virus the opportunity to, to mutate, although there may be some you know, pre-existing mutations against one therapy, those can't amplify and then continue to select for additional mutations. So probably a combination of protease inhibitors plus polymerase inhibitors and you know, maybe other things would ultimately be the most effective therapy. Thank you. Uh, Ira? Yeah, Brent, um, really beautiful work. Um, you, you might have heard about this story about pimantidine or Pepsid. So there's been some work at Northwell and some other places, Kevin Tracy at Northwell, about pimantidine also binding the three CL protease. Do you know anything about that? And um, how does that relate to some of the compounds that you've been working on? Yeah, so there have been now a bunch of papers on other like repurposing and, and other screens to look for inhibitors of the protease. And there are a bunch of compounds that can inhibit it. Uh, but the issue, with, as we've seen with the ones we've looked at, is always about potency, 
selectivity and then drug-like properties. So I would say none of these are really going to be things you can use out of the gate. We're going to have to get you know down. Usually you'd want something like single digit in animal or potency, good drug-like properties, cell permeability to have uh, an, an agent that you could real, you know, realistically use as a drug. So I would suspect all of these other things are, are gonna be starting points, but not the final drug. Uh, yes, can you hear me? This is David. Yes. Uh, yeah. Regarding the question on famotidine, uh, show in my group has shown that it has no activity against uh, the three CL protease or the papain like protease, and in virus culture assays, it has no activity. Oh, that's great. That's important to, to get that out. Thanks, David. Okay. There's a question uh, what is a warhead? Um, the warhead is the electrophilic, so the part of the inhibitor that, that reacts irreversibly with the protease. So that's there's different sort of chemical moieties that will allow the inhibitor to irreversibly inhibit the protease. So that's what we refer to as the warhead. 